We thank God for the opportunity to be here. I want to open with a word of prayer taken from a Colgate alum, Dr. Howard Thurman. Let us pray. Lord, open unto me light for my darkness. Open unto me courage for my fear. Lord, open unto me hope for my despair. Peace for my turmoil. Joy for my sorrow. Strength for my weakness. Wisdom for my confusion. Lord, open unto me. Forgiveness for my sins. Love for all of my hates. Lord, open unto me thyself for myself. Lord, dear Lord, open unto me. Amen. Amen. I want to go now to the book of Revelations, chapter 21. And thematically, I want to use verses 1 through 8. The focal verse will be verse 8. And then I want to look at Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 8. For the purposes of time, I will read only Revelations chapter 21 and verse 8. Wherein John says, But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vow, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the Adulterers, all of the liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. And then, of course, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8, Then I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Lord, here am I. Send me. Let the church say amen. Amen. I want to borrow the title of a very familiar, famous sermon from a preacher by the name of Dr. C.A.W. Clark. And I want to lay it against the backdrop of all that we have witnessed and felt throughout this nation these last 48 hours. I want to call this message, These Revolutionary Times, Cowardice, Courage, and the Call to Christian Ministry. The great American poet, social activist, and literary architect of the Hollow Renaissance, Langston Hughes, poses the most peculiar question in his famed 1951 poem entitled Harlem. Mm -hmm. uh, Hughes says, what happens to a dream deferred? Mm -hmm. Does it dry up like a razor in the sun, or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat? or crushed over like a surface sweet. Maybe it just sags like a heavy load, uh, or does it explode? Though Langston Hughes is undoubtedly addressing the ills of race, class, and social oppression, even still as we gather here on these sacred grounds, Langston's question still rings throughout this place. Uh, what really does happen to a dream deferred? What happens to a gift undeveloped? What happens to a vision unfulfilled? What happens to a big idea never fully explored? What happens to purpose unfulfilled, fear unconquered, intimidation unchallenged? What happens to a call gone unanswered? What happens to those who are called to be courageous when they are sidelined by cowardice? Here in Revelations, the 21st chapter, John tells us of a magnificent vision of the things to come. The idea of a new earth and a new heaven are familiar themes in both the New and the Old Testament, but none ever so fully and brilliantly described than by John here in the book of Revelation. Here in Revelation chapter 21, John tells us of a place where the glory and the majesty of God shall reign forever. In verses 1 through 7, John describes his vision of the New Jerusalem as a place where joy is unceasing, where adoration is overflowing, where peace is never faulting, where praise is never ending. What a marvelous vision this really is. 
But then John goes on. In verses 9 and on, John gives the details and the dimensions of this great city. John describes the foundations and the walls and the gates as being greater than the palace of Versailles, which sits in the countryside of Paris. Greater than the forbidden city, which rests at the center of Beijing. Greater than the villas which line the canals of Venice. Greater than the ancient cities of Carthage and Thebes and the great promenades of Greece and Rome. John describes a city greater than the African fortified kingdoms of Ghana, Mali, and Ethiopia, and with vivid detail, like Michelangelo's ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, or Vermeer Bearden's Black Madonna and Child. John paints for us a visual masterpiece of the things yet to come. But wedged here between verses 1 and 7, and before the glories of verses 9 and 27, here in verse 8, before we get to swept up by the promise of this great heavenly reward, John describes the qualifications for access into the city. We have here in verse 8, John pointedly writes, but the cowardly, say that with me, the cowardly, the cowardly. The unbelieving, the vow, the murderers, the sexually immoral, on and on and on. They will be consigned to the fiery lake, mm. which burns with sulfur, and this shall be the second death. Oh, beloved, I want you to look at this text with me. Look at what group leads these unfortunate souls, the cowards. Right here with the unbelieving, right here with the vile, in good company with the murderers, right in the middle of the sexually immoral, right here amidst those who practice magic tricks, are adulterers, those who are prone to lies, you know, those big sins. Right here, John says, but the cowardly shall not enter the city. John is not speaking here of the natural timidity, but the kind of cowardice which chooses self and safety before the full-blooded witness of Jesus the Christ. Those who chickened out somewhere in life, those who failed to give uh, their full life to the Lord, those who hid their witness behind piety and tradition, those who said nothing of the evils of this world, those who stood for only comfort and mediocrity, those who concealed their light under a bush, those who failed to fight the good fight, with their full heart and their full soul, those who allowed the fear of public scrutiny to bring them to silence while others suffered, those who failed to take up their cross and follow the master. Yes, those who sat by the sidelines too afraid to enter the race of the Christian call. Yes, John says, these shall not enter the holy city. And in these revolutionary times, beloved, all over the globe, people on every continent and of every walk of life are in search for a light of hope and a break from the madness of our times. From the devastating destruction of racism and white supremacy in America to the genocide in Africa and the cultural expression in the Middle East. From our slaughtered black bodies of America's abandoned children, too many to name, to our LGBTQ brothers and sisters who are yet martyred in the endless struggle for their right to express their love and devotion. From the south side of Chicago, torn by gang wars and corruption, to the plains of Russia, from the cradle of Africa to the clay hills of Georgia, from the women of Iraq to the children of Vietnam, from the Katrina victims of New Orleans to the flood victims of Indonesia. Yes, in these revolutionary times, people on every continent and in every city, people of every creed, and of every confirmation of faith, people of every culture and of every nationality battle with and they suffer from the effects of educational disparity and racial inequality, mm. economic insecurity with the lack of political diplomacy, worldly insobriety with no regard to human dignity, ethical deformity with no reverence to cosmic divinity. Mm. The absence of morality and the prevailing deviation from authenticity, the lack of individual sanctity and the overabundance of vulgarity, communal animosity coupled with the dangers of religious complacency. Yes, in these revolutionary times, 
where it is unsafe in a country like America where one cannot wear a hoodie, cannot sell cigarettes, cannot play with fake guns, cannot sell CDs, cannot be pulled over, cannot ask for help after a car accident when these things are qualifications for murder in these revolutionary times. Who will stand for these? Yes. Who here will serve? Who here will stand in the gap? Who here will walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful? Who here will speak out for what is right? Who here will tell hell no and heaven yes? Who here will sacrifice your aim? Who will sing victoriously? Who will write with passion and conviction? Who here will answer the call? Then I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Amen. Whom shall I send, beloved? And who will go for us? And I said, Lord, here am I. Lord, send me. The gospel of Jesus Christ must be preached within the church and the public sphere. While the racist presidential candidates incite riots and add pimped out preachers to their payrolls. Mm. <laughs> While the massacres of some are a national tragedy and the constant lynching of others are commonplace. The witness of the apostles must go forth for those who are in need of peace and comfort, love and affirmation. The fervor of Priscilla and Aquila is needed to reach those who lay right outside the doorsteps of the church. Yes. The prophetic utterance of Amos as well as the soothing comforts of the Psalms are needed to ease the pains of this wretched world. And who better to go than you? Who better to stand in the gap than someone with your gifts and your talents? Who better to lead than those here today who are faithful and hard and learned in their minds? Who will answer the call? Who will be courageous? Who will serve in these revolutionary times? The past is yours, learn from it. The present is yours, fulfill it. The future is yours, preserve it. The Bible is yours, read it. The lost are yours, reach them. The truth is yours, believe it. Hatred is yours, cure it. Children are yours, teach them. Sickness is yours, heal it. Racism is yours, end it, but the call is yours, answer it. And so what happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun, or fester like a saw and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat, or crust over like a sugary sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load. Or does it 